One of the main articles I asked you to read was from Creative License, a book by Kemba McLeod and Peter DeCola. And I wanted you to read through a chapter on, on the golden age of sampling, which they list as 1987 um, through 1992 as being this like time. And, <clears throat> you know, we know that, you know, sampling um, became prominent in hip hop after 1985, after, after the bridge. Um, it became, you know, a way of making hip hop and rap music other than just using, you know, drum machines. Uh, but the material was pretty limited to, you know, ultimate breaks and beats records and James Brown sounds. So there was a fairly a small uh, uh, you know, a small archive that was mined, so to speak, by these beat makers and producers of that time. And now why McLeod and DeCola call this the golden age is because, you know, from 87, and that's really when, like, sampling really started to, like, pick up in terms of people started finding different sources of material other than, like, James Brown and, and UBB stuff. And they started going, you know, into psychedelic rock records and jazz and all these other places for their, you know, clay to mold into hip-hop music. But the amazing thing about this time, this, this very short moment in time, was that these artists could sample without afraid of being, without fear of lawsuit. You know, at, when, we, when we watch uh, Copyright Criminals, it was actually directed by Kemba McLeod. Um, you kind of see this, like this is a whole time of innocence, you know, where artists were just like, they just didn't know about copyright law, right? These are kids, again, you know, young, uh, young people who are probably, you know, 19, 20, you know, 21, 22, uh, maybe even younger, who don't really have a sense of the music business, um, you know, in general. Um, but there also hadn't been estab any established lawsuits over sampling. Now, we had, had, you know, some lawsuits earlier regarding interpolation and disco rap and some other moments where... Um, there were some lawsuits, but there'd been no establishment that, you know, if you want to sample someone else's music, you had to clear that sample. That means get a license. So there was this era where people just made music out of whatever they found and they thought would sound really good, you know? Um, and that is just like that freedom, that creative freedom, you know, what, what McLeod calls creative license is just so, so super vital to you know, the music, and, you know, once um, copyright law, sample clearance, culture became standard, you know, the music changes, and it changes for better, and it changes uh, for worse, in the sense of what was once an unlimited mine for you to dig in became limited to what you could clear, or what you could change so much that no one would, would know. Um, but also part of, part of what happens during this, this period for them is, is, is you start to see sampling technology become more accessible, right? With Marley Marl and, you know, um, you know, Arthur Baker, thinking back to Planet Rock and stuff like that, um, and, and these, these early producers who had sampling equipment, you know, that was like studio equipment. Like you had to have access to a recording studio and be in that field to have access to, to the equipment because it was just so expensive. But through the early mid 80s with technology, um, specifically the, um, you know, the SB 1200, um, some of the early Akai MPCs um, that we'll talk about, you know, uh, in a forthcoming unit, you know, with the, the advent of these um, smaller production sampling machines that allowed you to sample and chop stuff up, break stuff up, and program it, and then you know sequence it. Essentially, make it into music. So it allowed you to, you know, grab grab it. You know, it allowed you to manip, you know, chop it up, manipulate the the sample material, program it. So that, you know, once you've broken it up, then you're able to um, assign it to pads and change it in some way. Change how fast it is. Change. Uh, how much bass or, or, or highs are present, wh whatever, reverse it, whatever, and then sequence it, which is play those pads containing those sounds in a different order to create, to create music, right? 
Um, this technology just became more democratic. It became more accessible. You know, sampling machines became you know went down to two or three thousand dollars from fifty thousand dollars in a short amount of time, <clears throat> um, which was still quite expensive. But you know, if you wanted to make beats. You figured out how to how to get your SP12. You know, like you figured it out. So what started happening is you have this, you know, this aesthetic, the South Bronx aesthetic, this DJ sampling, creating loops, finding you know material that people maybe don't know but they'll think is dope, and chopping it and flipping it in your own way and giving it back, giving it back to people. You know, the DJ mindset, the Grandmaster Flash, Quick Mix theory. Theodore, all those, all those ideas, Herc's merry-go-round, all that stuff, the break, you know, um, you know that, that ideology fused with the ability to extend that ideology into digital sampling technology. Um, and this allowed for artists to make these very, like, impressive collages. And the way to think about collage is, you know, you combine A plus B equals C, which is a new meaning, a new, a totally new, new thing in a new context. So a collage is combining different elements that maybe seem uh, totally like antithetical, totally opposite of one another. A, you know, a rock, you know, a rock drum drum break record with a, you know a jazz sample or whatever whatever it is, and then used with hip hop lyrics, you know, to talk about, you know, uh, youth identity and sexuality in the early 90s, you know, um, and that was really powerful, you know. And the important thing, too, is, you know, through much of the early 80s, even through Run DMC, through all that stuff, you know, Sugar Hill Gang, uh, people in the music industry still thought it was going to be a passing fad, that hip-hop and rap was just going to go away um and it it as i said it did in ways right like the dj went away temporarily um the hip-hop culture as experienced in the rec centers and parks you know went went away um died off the dance died off but it came back and stayed alive in new in new forms and by the late 80s you know you know people in the industries, not necessarily the culture, like cultural members, like this was their life, you know, um, but people in the industry, those seeking to make money off of these people's lives, uh, realized that this was no longer just going to pass away. It had been, you know, 10 years, you know, eight, nine, 10 years since Rapper's Delight, whatever it is, you know, and the music's here to stay. And it's, guess what? It's fucking lucrative. And, and guess what? You know, uh, the consumer base is... Uh, very diverse, and guess what? White people are buying rap music, you know, um, which meant that the market was just vast, and it was ripe for for the taking and for exploiting, you know. Um, um, and with that came consequences. When we talk about, um, you know, subcultural incorporation, we talk about distillation of of art, you know, all those all those sort of things that are kind of negative, um, uh, that are of a concern, you know. Like uh, Ken Brew and Nicola, you know, suggests it's like by, you know, the late 90s, the reason why this creative freedom to sample whatever you want went away was because people realized like not only were like hip hop and rap records like sampling other people, they were making lots of money and they were not going anywhere. So how do we regulate their creativity and profit off of their creativity because they're using our creativity, you know, or, what, or whatever, to make their music.